My name is Jeff Bruner, and joining me today to talk to us about Open Athens is Jeff Arsenault, who is a senior account executive for software as a service with a focus on uh, Open Athens. Jeff, uh, I'm going to end my screen share so that you can take the wheel. Uh, let me know if you have any trouble getting your screen to share. Great, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, and I'll just get, again uh, introduce myself. I'm Jeff Arsenal. I work at EBSCO um, with our partner, Open Athens. Uh, we're two different companies, but we we are pretty tightly connected in terms of how we implement and, and offer the Open Athens service. So, what the goal here today is give you a brief overview of what Open Athens is, what it might be able to do for your institutions, particularly, and if there's time, just give you a quick tour of the actual administrative module. Uh, so um, I don't know if there's a forum for questions, but I have a few colleagues on here today who can monitor that if you want to chat in your questions. Uh, anything that we can get to in terms of answers, we will, and anything that we can't, uh, we certainly can follow up with you individually. Um, and that pertains to any uh, questions that you might have if we don't, for example, cover a topic that, uh, that, that is relevant to you or you want to see, please feel free to, to follow up with us directly. And we appreciate, Jeff, the opportunity to speak to Will's members. And uh, without further ado, I'll get into it here and uh, see if we have the, if I have the ability, yep, I do, to share our screen and give me one moment. Okay, Zoom. Uh, let me see if I can grab the proper screen here. There we go. All right. So, uh, again, Open Athens is uh, considered a single sign on application that can work either independently or in concert with other authentication services that you might have available at your institutions. Um, it, it we'll get into a little more detail about just how it does that, but uh, Open Athens was a product that was designed expressly for the library and the fairly unique authentication environment that most libraries manage these days. Um, there are lots of legacy protocols, lots of different uh, on-premise and remote applications and, and, and patrons to support. Uh, so making sense of all that can be a little challenging at times. Uh, and that's what Open Athens is designed to, to simplify and really uh, empower uh, the library itself, uh, as well as creating efficiencies for uh, your, your, our colleagues in, in information tech or IT uh, who are usually tasked with the, the lion's share of, of work around authentication. So Open Athens is, is a single sign-on application at its heart. And by that, we essentially mean that your patrons are gonna be using a single set of credentials, hopefully ones they're already familiar with and using to access all of your library's electronic resources. Open Athens itself is also considered an IAM or identity and access management tool and essentially what that means, as you might surmise, is it allows you as administrators to determine who has access to which resources. Uh, and that is predicated on roles at your institution. Those rules around access might be as broad as everyone here has access to everything all the time. That's our policy or you might have a very granular access policy where, for example, students of different majors or concentrations might have different content available to them based on what they have to do perform in terms of research. Um, again, it's, it's access management and attributes or data points about your patrons are what drives some of those rules-based permissions. And we'll get into exactly how Open Athens handles that as well in a few moments. Open Athens itself is built upon the SAML 
uh, authentication protocol. That's an acronym. There are many in authentication. It stands for security assertion markup language. It's been around for some time. It's been around for about as long as, as IP proxy tools like Easy Proxy and WAM have been around. Um, one of the differences the, between SAML and IP as a protocol uh, are, is the ability to personalize platforms, recognize patrons as individuals, which by the way, does not require personally identifiable information, although you may choose to share that. Um, and security. SAML is one of the most secure protocols available. It's never been hacked. Uh, it's never been compromised. And uh, reasons why you might have heard of this more recently, even though it's been around for quite some time, uh, are that service provider, vendor platforms are being developed to take advantage of some of the ways that SAML can convey information securely, namely personalization, right? Patrons being recognized as mentioned as individuals, and that has some workflow benefits around content uh, that is sometimes problematic. Uh, Ebooks, for example, I'm sure you probably all have, have uh, had patrons come up and say, hey, I I get into this platform, but when I try to download this ebook, I run into an authentication prompt and it's different from what I typically use for credentials for the institution. Uh, workflow uh, hurdles like that, oftentimes personalization can simplify greatly and we'll get into exactly how that does that as well. Open Athens is cloud-based, so there's nothing for you to have to host or maintain. It's an iterative software product, which means generally you're always using the most recent version of the software that's available. So there's no uh, expensive or confusing upgrades down the road or you face degraded performance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, you're always using the most recent version and any improvements that are made to the software itself are, are automatically pushed out to all current subscribers. So in terms of, of thematic concerns around authentication, aside from making it easy for patrons to know how to get access to resources and in light of the current context to do that from just about anywhere, we could no longer can assume that everyone's gonna be in one general location or on campus or, or, or in other areas. And Open Athens or single sign-on in general frees patrons from some of those geographic limitations that tools like traditional IP might uh, have to force. Uh, so that enables the library to configure access from wherever patrons might be, uh, which is helpful. You don't, no longer have to worry about that geographic aspect. Uh, so uh, in terms of configuration, Open Athens offers an interface, an intuitive interface that is not designed for solely for information professionals, those of you that may have configured authentication or still do, uh, know that largely a lot of that's managed in code. It requires some technical expertise and, uh, and, and Open Athens was designed expressly by librarians to, to, to kind of combat that, give you a, a space to work in that's not daunting, but still powerful enough to allow you to determine, again, uh, which of your patrons have access to which of your resources based on your, your in institutional philosophies. As mentioned, personalization is increasingly the expectation of our patrons, especially younger patrons who are very much used to at this point, being able to log into one platform on the open web with credentials from another platform. And I think certainly expect that of our post-secondary institutions. On the other end, the back end, Open Athens also offers you, the administrators, uh, an analytics tool so you can determine just how your patrons are interacting with your content. And that can be really helpful for decisions around content management, uh, which uh, products to bring on and, and what's relevant to, to your patrons. They can vote with their usage in essence. And you can categorize that usage, uh, hearkening back to some of those first concepts that I mentioned. Um, and in a lot of different manners, you can view usage as granular as the individual patron. You can view usage in groups that might be really helpful. For example, if you allocate your budgets for content by department, you can break down usage by department and vendor. 
Uh, but really, the, the analytics module is, is unlimited. It's limited only by the information that you can and or are willing to share. And all of this is underpinned by an emphasis on security and privacy. You can make uh, Open Athens as anonymized as any protocol, IP included, uh, or you can make it highly configured and personalized and, and really make a, 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 a user experience uh, personalized and pleasant and, and tailored to the individual. It's really, up to, again, up to you. Um, and of course, what the service provider platforms are capable of. There's different functionality available there, as I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware. So for the end user, authentication is an abstract. It's just a means to an end. Really what end users are concerned with is getting to the content that they need to finish whatever uh, projects or research that they're working on. They don't give much thought to how that happens unless there's an issue. Uh, so to that end, it really depends on that current user journey that you have curated right now, but patrons may not notice much. They may, as mentioned, notice that, hey, I don't have to worry about that secondary authentication prompt when I'm going to content like eBooks or, wow, I get into Science Direct and it recognizes me and it logs me right into my folder. That's really convenient. That's a time saver. Um, but again, it's up to your institution how and if you configure that, that type of user experience. For, for administrators, the, the user experience is, there are, is less subtle, the changes that are available for that. So you'll have an interface, as mentioned, to work in. That's different uh, in, in all likelihood from whatever you're currently using right now. Um, you'll be able to, again, determine who has access to which resources based on the information that you have and or choose to share. You'll have an analytics platform to evaluate how all that's going. And you have the ability, since Open Athens authenticates at the individual patron level, um, some of you may have experienced in the past uh, a breach of security whereby one of your vendors uh, turned off access for your entire institution until you're able to do some research, probably pour through thousands or millions of web logs to see which account it was. Open Athens can turn off individual accounts while you do that research. Oftentimes, that's just normal, someone's just doing a lot of research, a lot of downloads, it's perfectly legitimate usage. Um, so it doesn't disrupt your entire institution. And then lastly, um, regardless of how you provide identity, whether you're pointing Open Athens to your enterprise institutional directory tools like Microsoft Active Directory or Shibboleth or Okta, there are many tools that, that perform that functionality, uh, or you're using Open Athens itself as, a, as an identity provider and physically uploading the information for your patrons into the tool, you have a choice. Many institutions enable both. So you'll have an institutional directory, and then you can supplement or augment that with Open Athens for patrons who are more transient. Um, visiting faculty, lecturers, exchange students, folks who aren't going to be with your institution for a great period of time. You're not going to go through the trouble of adding them to your permanent directory, but nevertheless require access to your resources. It's a great way to incorporate that workflow and you can actually add an account um, and, and provide access within the space of a few moments. You could do that at your circulation or reference desk if one of your administrators uh, was, was handy with the service, which I'm sure they will be. All of that functionality wouldn't really amount to much value if it didn't work with the resources that you need to provide to your patrons. To that end, Open Athens has two means of connecting to, to resources. First, as mentioned, SAML, um, which is the typical single sign-on protocol when you hear that term, but it also has a managed IP proxy element to it uh, in the same service so that for the service providers that aren't currently supporting SAML, then we can absolutely connect to them using IP. So that includes about a, a good healthy percentage of, uh, of all service providers that are out there. And to that end, we can even determine whether your service providers are functional in terms of connectivity to Open Athens. 
So the analytics tool, again, we have lots of different stories we can tell using that, um, all predicated on the data that you have available, right? The more attributes and more data that you're able to share, the more the more information that you're able to, to facet with that, right? So the more attributes you have, the more ways you can determine the data that you're able to, to both uh, collect and look at. And you can break down those reports as mentioned by attribute, right? Getting as granular as the individual patron uh, or you can see, you can view usage by department or group or whatever attributes that you have and are, and are able to share and, and we're able to map for you. You can also, uh, outside of that internal tool that Open Athens provides for analytics, you can send that information programmatically with an optional API out to other tools that you may already be managing in terms of uh, visual analytics. These tools like Tableau, Power BI, Click, Google Analytics that might be managed for your enterprise. You can feed Open Athens as another data stream and synthesize that information uh, so that it's more useful for everybody around the, the institution and also help you convey the value of the library to the institution at large. A lot of times that's an abstract, difficult to quantify, but with some of this usage information, uh, you're able to, to make shed some light on that and make it more empirical data driven. So in terms of identity as discussed, most institutions these days are using what we would term a local directory. Those are tools like Active Directory, um, Ping, Okta, Federate, uh, Ping, Federate, Okta, Shibboleth, et cetera. Um, you can also use Open Athens as your primary, secondary, tertiary identity provider. Uh, or, and if you do so, you can have your patrons create their own accounts. Um, for example, uh, if you didn't have an identity provider and you're implementing Open Athens for your library, patrons can create their own accounts. You can, you can create a self-registration page for that purpose so that you're not having to administrate hundreds or thousands of accounts, create, et cetera. Um, and those can even harv be created to harvest attributes, right? Name, location, anything that you would want to, to have to, to power some of the, the identity and access management. Typically, and typically I mean probably 95 plus percent of institutions these days, we're connecting to a local directory. Um, there are lots of reasons for that. The benefits are largely that it's already being managed, it's already being updated as part of uh, information technologies, daily workflow, and it's current. When Open Athens is looking to that directory, you know, you're not, you're not automatically sending that to Open Athens. It queries that directory on a as needed basis, then uh, then that you know it's it's current because it's being maintained on a on a daily basis there. So in terms of um, questions that we get asked frequently, since we're in the realm of personally identifiable information, uh, we get asked a lot. Well, what do we have control over? What gets sent to service providers in, in order to to facilitate this? Uh, and the answer there is ultimately you have complete autonomy over what, if any information ever gets shared with a service provider or even with Open Athens for the purposes of analytics. So again, uh, the, the attributes have to exist, but you also have to actively choose what to send. And there are plenty of instances where there's no personally identifiable information being sent. And there are many others where uh, where institutions are mapping dozens of attributes. It just gives you that many more ways to understand how usage is occurring or to power uh, highly configured personalization instances for your patrons, making that user journey a little warmer and friendlier. In terms of content and, and applications that Open Athens can work with, it's not limited solely to content platforms. You can use single sign-on and SAML to authenticate into other tools that you might supply, learning management systems, student information systems, or you might just choose to have uh, those tools look to the same identity providers that Open Athens looks to as well in terms of being able to, to authenticate.
So in terms of IP access, we get asked frequently, hey, we have IP access for our on-premise patrons. Uh, can we continue to support that and have Open Athens serve our remote users or, or anyone that's not on campus? Uh, and the short answer to that question is yes, you can. Uh, Open Athens has what's called an IP bypass functionality. And that allows, we essentially would whitelist or register your IP addresses or ranges for your on-premise on access. Open Athens would see a request coming from that and would back off. Um, uh, Easy Proxy and some other tools have a similar feature if you wanted to, to, to not require your patrons to authenticate on campus. On the, it's easy to, to turn on and off. We recommend using Open Athens, especially if you have a SAML-based service provider, um, because patrons are, are, are likely going to log into uh, another tool that you have and have a SAML session open. So they may not even notice uh, that, the, that they're using Open Athens when they're on premise. And you get this, the, the side benefits of uh, allowing personalization, which isn't possible with IP. It just doesn't have the granularity. And you have the, uh, the ability to quantify that usage with Open Athens, which you wouldn't if we're using solely IP. You, you would at the, at the platform level, but you wouldn't have the granularity that you do with Open Athens. In terms of setup, we at EBSCO provide full implementation. So if you decided that you wanted to go with Open Athens, you would be assigned an implementation team headed by an implementation project manager uh, someone that would essentially be your consultative expert, provide you with advice and, uh, and, and drive the configuration with our team. And, and essentially we require two main bits of information to set Open Athens up, uh, a list of the subscriptions that you have, essentially the service providers that you, uh, that you have e-content from, and a way to connect to that identity provider. Um, typically that is a SAML metadata URL, or it may be LDAP parameters, or if we're creating something bespoke, it might be API parameters. So we could create uh, that connection with callbacks. But again, that's typically the domain of IT. You may know in the library exactly what these tools are. Open Athens has wizards. It's quite simple to set this up. And again, we do that for you with your assistance. Uh, and beyond that, there's some other information to gather, right? What kind of hierarchy are we going to create? That's relevant uh, to both access and analytics on uh, those largely driven by the attributes that you have available. Um, but once we have all that information, there's a lot of gathering at the beginning, we at, at EBSCO will go and create the, the hierarchy for you. We'll contact vendors, right? Either exchange SAML metadata or register the Open Athens static IP address that has been assigned to you. Uh, and so once we have that hierarchy, we have vendor contact completed, we can start testing links. And that's really how Open Athens connects patrons out to content. So whatever tools you use to facilitate that access, whether that is a discovery service or libguides or your OPAC, right? Um, learning management system, anywhere that those link permanent links currently live, we'll go out and, and we'll reconfigure. Open Athens works very similar, similarly to other tools where uh, we have a, a snippet of syntax that prepends all of those URLs. Um, and that's that, that clues in the service providers, hey, this request is, is coming from Institution X uh, and all of the information for the patron. Are they an active member of your community? Have you provided them with access to this resource? Are we sending any other information over to them in, generally for the purpose of personalization? Um, once we're confident that those links are working as they should, for whom they should, any filters that we've created are functioning as intended, um, resources are allocated correctly, then we can start to look at a go live date. And essentially that's when we're moving from whatever is currently providing authentication to Open Athens. And generally that's a 
kind of a switch flipping exercise. Yesterday we use this, today we use Open Athens, of course, pre um, predicated or, or, or um, there's preparation leading up to that go live date. Um, but we'll generally pick a time that doesn't have heavy patron pressure so that we're not um, changing authentication or, or, or creating any kind of, of um, inconsistencies at a critical time for your patrons. Once we're live, uh, you're essentially using Open Athens for authentication, and we have our colleagues in support uh, are, are um, paying attention to what we call user acceptance testing, or UAT. It's just for a couple weeks in general after we're live, able to jump on any inconsistencies. But by and large, we're going to find that during the test phase here. And, and, uh, and, and once we're confident you're using Open Athens, it's working, then that rolls over to our support team uh, for the duration of your subscription. And some of you may be where our support colleagues are available live 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So uh, you have someone on the other end of the, the phone to contact if you have inconsistencies with authentication, or certainly you can use our EBSCO Connect portal as some of you are, are no doubt already doing. Um, ultimately, it serves to reiterate uh, in, in terms of data that you have full autonomy over what happens with that information. Um, we can execute any kind of policies as long as the information is, is provided, um, but you're going to tell us at EBSCO during implementation how that gets configured and what you want to provide and share. Um, we have lots more information. We'll share this with our Wills colleagues and, and in turn can share with you. But each of these links goes out to a different resource um, on our site at EBSCO, our, on Open Athens site. Um, and there are all kinds of, uh, of schematics. There are case studies, so you can hear Open Athens from your peers' perspective, not necessarily through an EBSCO or, or Open Athens prism. Um, security questionnaires. We have uh, all kinds of compliance documentation for your, for your local regulations. What does Open Athens do? What are the information sharing policies? How do we configure that? Our colleagues can, as mentioned, answer questions that you have at any point during the process, before, during, after the sale. And we have uh, some fantastic other references. The onboarding guide is my personal favorite. It really is a, a very simplified walkthrough of everything that you might want to consider while changing authentication and what to expect once you do. There's a virtual learning environment, self-guided, self-paced tool that allows you to become more proficient administrating Open Athens. And then as mentioned, lots of FAQs, IT I put on here, they're the most commonly asked and, and the most require the most definitive answers. So those are oftentimes really helpful to have access to. And then there's a full documentation page that Open Athens provides um, themselves that is comprehensive in scope. Um, but again, if you don't find the answers to questions that you specifically uh, have in ha have in mind, you can always reach out to us at, at EBSCO and our partners at Open Athens as well. Um, so I'll turn it over. I think we're right close to the to the stop time. I'll turn it over to any questions that we might have. Jeff, I haven't seen any questions come into the chat or our Q&A uh, module, but uh, this is a time for those in the live session. If you do want to uh, type a question into the chat box. We'll be happy to uh, make sure that Jeff uh, can see it and answer it. Maybe we'll just wait a minute here. Um, sure. While that, uh, well, folks have a chance to do that. Uh, Jeff, th thank you. Uh, while we're waiting to see if any questions come in, I'll just uh, repeat my thanks for joining us today. I'm I'm excited about this. I know that uh, Open Athens uh, has been been around for a little while, but I'm hearing about it more and more now. So I, I feel like it's, it's gaining some additional momentum and, and um, more kind of a widespread adoption. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, it, it, again, it's, uh, it's, it, it's been around for some time, as you, as you intimated there. I think what, what has been driving more of the, the, the word of mouth and, and, and general adoption is the functionality having been developed on the service provider or the vendor end of things. There, 
it's one thing to be able to send over securely a bunch of information, but on the other end, the, the, the re recipient has to be able to do something meaningful with that. And I think that that functionality is, it has really started being developed um, as these protocols become more robust and mature, right? You know, as mentioned, lots of, of us are familiar with our what, whatever we do on the open web, right? Our personal business and banking and things like that, bills, bill paying. Um, and we, we th these systems are trustworthy and we can send some valuable information. Um, but, but largely what happens is that gets anonymized and encrypted and, and you know, multi layers of protection. So, you know, you're in the library, you're often fighting those, those, those competing mandates, right, of privacy and analytics or, 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 or a really pleasant and highly configured user journey. I think with SAML, you have the ability to, to satisfy both. All right. As mentioned, it can be as anonymized as sending all, all that SAML requires is a single attribute. As long as it's unique amongst your patrons, that can and is in many practices just a barcode. That's all anyone sends. Um, and that can fuel personalization. It can log patrons directly into their folders. Um, or you can send lots of attributes, first name, last name, uh, username, et cetera, as long as that's relevant and useful for the end, for the for the service provider, they can make a, a more pleasant and and personally proprietary conf, con, proprietarily configured um, experience for patrons. So it's really up to you. The good news is these tools, and Open Athens is not the only one, these tools allow for uh, for you as an institution, uh, the policies to reflect what you believe. So, so flexibility is the name of the game, but you're absolutely right. We're seeing it a lot. COVID certainly um, exposed a lot of, of, of our policies. Everyone experienced it, uh, you, know, you know, in terms of remote access. So oh, I can't get to this tool because it's, traditionally you've been in a, in a, in your office or a single place to access that, that paradigm changed overnight. And it took some time for think for all of us to, to really, uh, to, to, to really create policy and, and, and technology around that. But, um, but it's, it's useful. I think all of us can, can agree that, uh, you know, if, if COVID had happened 10 years previous, it would have been a very different experience for those of us to, to be able to be productive, work, study, do everything that we do. Um, and I think that, that authentication, remote access was one of the largest reasons why that happens. And, and the fact that we had these protocols that made that secure and feasible um, were, were, were a large part of that. So yeah, that's, that's a pretty astute observation, Jeff, I agree. Well, fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I agree as well. Um, I, I haven't had any uh, questions come into either of the places where questions normally come in. So um, I think we maybe can call uh, that uh, a completed session for today. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and I will, uh, of course, any questions that I receive after the fact or or based on the, the recording being shared out, um, I will gladly uh pass along to you or to Jay or both, depending on the nature of the question, of course. Um, and uh, uh, again, uh, thanks everybody for being here. Um, if you uh, are watching the live session, the uh, whole session has been recording. Uh, it takes a little while for that to render and for us to share it out onto our channels, but uh, we'll make sure that you get a copy of the recording sent directly to you, uh, but also our typical uh, kind of mailing lists for sharing these sorts of things will get uh, a ping with the, uh, the recording link as well. All right, uh, I think that's the end of our session for today. Thank you, Jeff Arsenault for joining us. Thank you, Jay Hess pleasure. for uh, helping us to organize this. And thank you to everyone who attended and watched. Uh, it is Friday in the real world. If you're watching this live, it's Friday for you. Uh, if you're watching the recording, uh, I don't know what day it is, but uh, sorry if it's not Friday. Uh, <laughs> take care everyone and have a great weekend. Great, thanks so much all. Cheers, Jeff, thank you. Bye.